mystical Cause they wonder how I do that deal Wanna bread, got them like, uh, who, what, where, Pierre born And yeah, my flight crew right here, now where your wings at? North Face, not sack, but I'm South K Jordan Jenks grew up in South Carolina but he would spend every summer and winter break in New York for a couple weeks or months at a time. His uncle there would work on music a lot and his uncle's friends would rap. This would inspire Jordan to rap too, but just for fun. I like to rap, so that's really why I got into music. His uncle showed him how to download beats by typing in instrumentals on the internet and he would record his first songs. Uncle Dwight's computer also had Fruity Loops installed and he always thought his uncle was playing some type of video game. Sparking his interest, he would start messing around with the program as well, making his very first beats. After about two summers, his uncle gave him that same computer and said, Here, you're better than me. Have this shit. He deadass gave me his computer. Jordan started making music in high school, mostly rapping and making beats on the side. After high school, he convinced his parents to let him go to school in Atlanta for graphic design. He attended for about a year, but got in trouble and would later get suspended. So he decided to drop out altogether. I remember when I quit. When I stopped going to school and how everybody stopped talking to me. He returned home at 18 and was working at a Walmart and a Target in South Carolina. He didn't enjoy it. That shit was terrible. But he had time to think about what he really wanted to do with his life. He knew he wanted to do music. Once again talking to his uncle, he would tell him he might as well go to school for music since he's already recording himself and he could just be in the studio all day. He thought about it, but his only issue was who was he going to work with in New York that was lit? He decided he was going to go to Atlanta instead because someone was blowing up there every six months. He did a nine month engineering program, but at the end he wouldn't even pass until his second try. During his nine month schooling, his school hosted a beat battle. He ended up in the final rounds but lost. But because he came in second, he was put into another beat battle. This second beat battle would have a guest speaker, DJ Byrne. Pierre would play his beats, and the first beat he played was a Street Fighter type beat. DJ Burn One went crazy, and Pierre knew he would like that beat. He said that shit's hard as fuck, and then he invited Pierre to the studio. The studio DJ Burn One brought him to was Mad Studios in Atlanta. When they found out he went to school for engineering, they offered him a job as well. Young Nudie would be one of the first sessions he would have, before Nudie blew up. Pierre didn't know it was 21 Savage's cousin at the time. He didn't even play in beats at first. He just thought he sounded like Gucci Mane and he really liked his style. He didn't even know I made beats the first day. I wasn't on it, I was just trying to engineer that day. After spending some time in Atlanta, it started to change his mindset about things. He would see rappers blow up every couple months right before his eyes. People like 21 Savage and Lil Yachty, who recorded in the same studio he worked. They would go from nobodies to superstars overnight. This honestly inspired him to quit his job and just go harder, living in the studio. He said everyone down the street is blowing up. After seeing this over and over, he had seen enough. He knew he had to blow up. He might not have been there, but he was close enough around it to feel the energy. He knew he had to do something different. While he was recording Young Nudie in the studio, Nudie already had a bunch of beats he was working on for his project Slimeball 1. Jetson Maid and Metro Boomin were some of the producers already working with Young Nudie. After getting a little closer, Pierre would show Nudie his beats as well, and they clicked instantly. They started to work together for a while. It would become a regular thing. These would also be some of Pierre's first placements. In the end, he ended up recording and producing most of Slimeball 1. I'm about to get Pierre to come out here, y'all. Y'all stay tuned. After making a name for himself engineering in Atlanta, he got offered a job at Epic Records to engineer. Thinking it would be a good idea for his music career and getting his foot in the door, he took the job. I thought it was going to lead me to like a label deal or a record deal. Or... He quickly regretted this decision after being forced to work non-stop around the clock in the studio, including holidays. He started to grow apart from Young Nudie as well, and he missed his old studio. This was an important lesson to be learned, because sometimes the nice studio backed by the major label isn't actually going to do as much for your career as the small studio up the street that help you build those impactful friendships and all around good music. Nudie was still wanting to record all the time. He pressed Pierre for recording sessions, but he was too busy. After getting frustrated, he even unfollowed Pierre on Instagram. Pierre felt bad because it wasn't even like that. He felt like in these bigger studios, his clients didn't like rappers. He felt like they saw them as bad guys coming to fuck shit up in the studio, when in reality, they were just trying to make it out of their situation. 
Eventually though, Pierre started to sneak nudie in the studio late nights around 2 a.m. when no one was around. It actually took him a while to get out of Epic Records. He was there for just over a year, feeling stuck. Eventually he had had enough and he decided to quit on the spot. Nobody saw it coming. Bro, I really just dipped and never talked to them ever again. <laughs> On that same day he quit though, he would get a call from Nudie's manager, $1, who told him Metro Boomin wanted him to come to the studio to cook up. It was crazy because he had just quit his job. His work on Slimeball had caught Metro's attention, and he was literally leaving Epic Records while he got the call. He immediately drove over to the studio. He went over for a session and made beats with Southside, Metro, and Spiffy. It was a reminder to him of what he wanted. It would be one of the best sessions he ever had. To him, this had to be a sign. Knowing he still had to make some money though, he would pick up recording sessions at different studios whenever he could. One of those being 12 Music Group Studio. He was engineering for a session with a rapper named K-Supreme. The session started off as one of the worst but would turn into probably the most impactful relationship of his career. Here's why. Pierre always introduced himself as P, so no one really knew he was the producer or engineer for Nudie. They didn't really care though. That day they were busy fucking around in the studio and they didn't realize who he was. Pierre got upset and told him, y'all ain't trying to work, so I'm gonna just go play some beats for Nudie instead. They immediately changed the vibes and switched up. K Supreme was like, oh shit, you're Pierre. I love your beats. Deciding not to leave, they immediately started to vibe. Pierre had some fresh beats to play that day. He played some, but he also left some with K Supreme, which isn't something he normally does. He likes to work face to face with people. He always said he never really sent beats out like that, but this time, he did. I prefer to be in the studio with the artists. The session ended for the night and they planned to record again in a few days. When they linked up again, K Supreme casually mentions to Pierre, hey, Yo, Cardi did your beat. I gave him the beat. I was just like, I got mad. I was like, what the fuck? But Pierre didn't like not knowing who was on his beats. Nobody called him or bothered to tell him. He was upset at first because he felt like he could make a beat for Cardi directly. So he tried to get a hold of Cardi and find out where he was, but he wasn't able to reach him. He even told K Supreme, I give you those beats. To which he responded, if Cardi gonna hop on your beat, let him hop on it. Literally the same day, Cardi would post a clip to Instagram of him rapping in the car to one of Pierre's beats. The song was woke up like this, and two days later he heard Lil Uzi on Snapchat on the same song. Pierre was a little upset because he didn't even get to put his tag on this song. To this day, the official Vivo music video, not a single tag of Pierre is on the song. Cardi later got in touch with Pierre and calmed him down. He told him, yeah, I got Uzi on the song too and he really fucks with your beats. Pierre started cooking up beats getting ready for them to return to Atlanta so he could meet them face to face. Yo, Pierre, you wanna come out here? <laughs> About a month later, Cardi told him he was working on his self-titled tape, Playboy Cardi. Their session started with their Woke Up Like This song, and then they just kept adding more and more songs to the tape. They were even removing songs just to make space for the new ones. They ended up recording their hit song Magnolia that night. Unlike Woke Up Like This, he wanted to make sure this time people knew he made the beat. This is why we hear Pierre, you wanna come out here? Three times in the official music video. Yo, Pierre, you wanna come out here? Even though Woke Up Like This was a massive success for Cardi, Magnolia would be an even bigger single. Everyone knew Cardi and Uzi made fire music together, but Magnolia was Cardi's first single with no features that really blew him up more than anything. It peaked at number 29 out of the top 100. This would obviously skyrocket Pierre's career, and soon everyone was familiar with his iconic producer tag. Unfortunately, before Pierre could really embrace the success of his hit record, Takashi69 would drop another viral song on a Pierre beat. This was Gummo and the song would absolutely blow up. But this also caused some business issues. Pierre had never actually given the yes for 6 9 to drop the song, and they would end up battling this out in court, where Pierre would win. Some people wondered why he was so upset about that. But like I said before, he really liked to work with people face to face, and he really picks and chooses who he works with. He likes to stay exclusive. With two songs blowing up, Playboy Cardi and Lil Uzi slaying his beats, Pierre's name would become mainstream faster than any producer before him. He would also drop his solo music as a rapper, which was something his newer fans didn't even know he did. P 
Pierre had a vision for himself and he made a point to never sell himself short of that. To this day, he continues to produce hit records, as well as dropping his solo album series, The Life of Pierre, despite people telling him to focus on beats only. Unlike most artists, money never really impressed Pierre, and this is why he continues to only work with artists he connects with in the studio, face to face, because that's where history is made. This is what he would want you to hear. Like, I don't think I've accomplished everything I want to accomplish. Give somebody advice on what to do to get there, because I'm still trying to get there my damn self. So I don't want to lie and be like, yeah, you should do this and do that. Honestly, I've just tried to be a good person, man. Really, that shit takes you a long way. You never know who likes you and tells somebody else that you're a great person. It could be deeper than just having some good music. That shit takes you a long way. Thanks for watching. Consider liking and subscribing for more content. Comment down below who you guys want to hear next.